All right. Good morning, everyone. It's nine o'clock and welcome to all of you and uh, our budget speech roundup for 2022. I think we're going to have quite a lot of fun this morning um, because there's lots to unpack coming out of yesterday's speech. My name is Dieter Schulze and I'm the CEO and tax service line leader of RSM South Africa. And I'm joined by Martin Ackerman, Chief Economist and Advisory Partner at Citadel. I'm going to be taking us through the tax proposals that came out of yesterday's budget. And Martin is going to unpack matters from an economic perspective, uh, which is always far more interesting than the tax side of things. So I must say, I can't wait to hear from Martin. Um, I love listening to him and uh, great speaker. So lots of wisdom coming through. So Martin, thank you. And uh, I'm going to kick off by <clears throat> having, a, uh, having a look at the tax proposals coming through from yesterday and uh, our, our new minister, Enoch Godongwana, our finance minister, stepped into the shoes of Tito Mboweni in August last year. Uh, I must say, I, I, I don't envy the task that uh, was put on his shoulders because coming out of COVID, um, <clears throat> the economy is very fragile. And I'm sure Martin will take us through the details of that. But uh, there was one thing that struck me listening to his speech yesterday. And that was that he was thrown this lifeline. And that lifeline was the improved tax collections compared to what was budgeted in 2021. And, and I must say that gave him a sense of confidence and gave him some scope to give us something back in terms of the budget. So from a tax perspective, I think we can be grateful for what's come out of the budget, looking at the uh, movement in tax tables and thresholds, et cetera, no real increases in taxes. So, so not much to report on, on the tax side of things, um, <clears throat> but uh, as far as change goes, but it's elsewhere where there is a lot going on. And, uh, and that's in the passages of National Treasury, where there is lots of talk and uh, lots of change underway. So with that, let's just have a look at where and, and how the projections unfolded, starting with the February 2021 budget. And what was projected at that point as far as tax revenue collections um, for the 2021 year, and that's year ending March 2021, it was projected to be 1.2 trillion rand. <clears throat> and then moving to March 2022, they expected collections of 1.365 trillion rand and so on. And that came, that came out in the 2021 budget. And really that was coming out of the COVID shock, the lockdowns, uh, uncertainty. And really, I think at that stage, um, the brakes were put on everything. So quite conservative at that point. And uh, I think we were all very relieved, uh, especially our finance minister, that in November, 2021, the medium term um, uh, <clears throat> the medium term budget projection statement uh, was released and in that they realized that in fact collections for 2021 were going to be closer to 1.25 uh, trillion and they revised the projections for March 2022 up to 1.485 trillion so 120 billion rand improvement on what was budgeted. So very exciting at that point. And, uh, and then further, yesterday, we see the minister announce that uh, the projected revenues for March 2022 have further increased and are expected to hit 1.547 trillion. So that's 180 billion rand improvement on what was originally budgeted in 2021. Looking at where that's coming from, 
and uh, and really what it was put down to was uh, an improvement in corporate income tax on the mining sector so commodity prices were booming profits were up so corporate income tax is collected in a additional 105 billion rand over what was budgeted. Personal income taxes by the same token improved by 37 billion rand. Um, <clears throat> so, so employers um, were more resilient and, uh, and we saw that through the PAYE system. Um, that also I think low interest rates helped cons con consumer spending there. So additional VAT collections of 13 and a half billion rand and uh, fuel levies and dividends tax um, and other taxes accounted for the rest. So 181 billion rand <coughs> improvement on what was originally budgeted. What's always interesting is where our tax collections come from. So what are the components of tax that make up that total 1.5 trillion rand that government looks to collect uh, come in March 2022. Well, personal income taxes make up by far the bulk of that. So we've got 36% um, of total tax revenues comes from per personal income tax and the majority of that through the PAYE system. That makes up the next biggest component, about 25%. Corporate income tax, they're projecting to make up 20% for the 2022 year. That's significantly up on where the trend has been in the past. And literally, it sits at around 15% normally. So because of this bumper profitability, we've seen that ramp up, thank goodness. Um, and then the rest of the taxes come in next. So fuel levies make up 5.8%, customs duties, excise duties, which are our taxes on cigarettes and tobacco um, and alcohol, uh, dividends tax small, and then the rest of the taxes after that. So always interesting to see where that work for 1.5 trillion rand is going to come from. Let's then move on and have a look at the personal income tax proposals and changes to the tax rates. And we see some relief coming through on the personal tax brackets. And essentially, the table has been stretched by 4.5%. So to counter the effect of inflation, if your salary goes up by 4.5%, in essence, you're not going to be paying more tax. So that's the impact of it, and that's cost the fiscus about 13.5 billion rand that they've given back to the taxpayer, and I must say that's a relief. Looking at where the rebates have gone, those have also gone up by 4.5% um, in the 2023 tax year, and that means that the tax thresholds now for people aged uh, below 65 years of age moves to 91,000. 250 rand or 7,600 rand a month odd. If you're six, between 65 and 75, 141,000 rand, and over 75, 157,000 rand. So a 4.5% increase in those thresholds, um, which I must say is, is most welcomed um, in these conditions. We see no change to the structure of the tax tables. The bands, are the, the bands have been stretched by 4.5%, but the rates are the same, and the maximum marginal tax rate remains at 45%. And that kicks in at 1.731 million rand. Monthly tax credits have also been increased. Uh, medical tax credits have been increased by 4.5%. And luckily, um, we see no change in the inclusion rate for CGT. So I think that's... Uh, that's made a lot of us um, quite happy and uh, we feel some relief on that front. The interest to the annual interest exemption limits, those haven't changed for many years, they won't change, and those remain um, as they were. Then some of the proposals, some more interesting ones that came through as far as I'm concerned. The one that was concerning us greatly was last year, they brought in the proposal, and in fact, um, there was some 
uh, some bills that legislated this that were brought through. Um, and that was dealing with immigrants. When you break your tax residence and uh, you leave your retirement funds behind in South Africa, the proposal was that at the point that you break tax residence, there was a deeming exit charge that applied to your retirement funds. And that would be collected when eventually you retired and withdrew from the fund and started being paid out a lump sum or a pension. Um, and there was a collection mechanism that then worked. An absolute nightmare. And uh, the retirement industry was up in arms about it. And uh, thank goodness they've pulled back on that. And they realized that actually the problem is the double tax treaties and they're going to have to go and renegotiate the double tax agreements with a number of countries, one of which is the UK. Um, the next is an interesting development and uh, a proposal that in the 2023 tax returns, if your personal assets exceed 50 million rand, lucky you, um, you're going to have to disclose your assets and liabilities at market value. At the moment, um, <coughs> provisional taxpayers with business interests must declare assets and liabilities in their tax returns at cost. They're looking to include a statement at market value, which is an interesting development. And I'm surprised it's taken them that long. But, uh, but obviously, the asset thresholds are quite high there. Um, and then also some proposal to look at relief for remote working arrangements. I must say that's most welcome. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing the document published on that one in due course. Employment tax incentive. Here we see um, uh, the encouragement of, uh, of businesses to employ youth. And those are people aged between 20 and 29. And we see an increase here, proposed increase, um, with effect from 1 March 2022 of 50% in the benefit. And, and this is, a, is an incentive that's claimed by the employer through the PAYE system. And uh, to the extent uh, they receive an incentive, they reduce the PAYE that they pay that month. So the mechanism is very effective and works efficiently. And we see there the um, limits increased on the maximum claim in the first 12 months to 1,500 Rand per month and from 500 Rand to 750 Rand in the second 12 months. And they're also, um, or they're also planning to extend the eligibility criteria, which is most welcome there. So watch that space um, if you might be eligible. And then moving to corporates and the proposals that came through there, the um, 2022 budget, so as far back as that, we saw the proposal to restructure the corporate income tax system. And through that process to reduce corporate income tax rates, um, align them more with the international norms. But in the process, they weren't going to give us that without taking away deductions. And that's where we see this two-prong approach and it's on limiting assessed losses and limiting interest deductions. So in essence, the reduction in the corporate tax rate has got a zero sum effect on the fiscus. So we now see um, in the monetary bills that came through yesterday as part of the budget, we see the effective date for this now being enacted. And for years of assessment ending on or after 31 March, 2023, for companies. The corporate income tax rate reduces from 28% to 27%. So that's a welcome change. Um, all you accountants out there are going to be looking at this and going, oh my word, that means deferred tax calculation changes, change in tax rate, um, and when do we have to apply this, and what are the calculations? So good luck with that. Um, We've then got uh, the set-off of, of assessed losses that will also come through with effect from the same date. And uh, the set-off of, of an assessed loss by a company will be limited to the greater of 1 million rand or 80% of taxable income. 
So essentially, if your taxable income is below a million rand, um, there'll be no limitation that applies. But in excess of that, in essence, you'll still be taxed on 20% of your taxable income for that year without being able to offset the full extent of your assessed loss. You will be able to carry the assessed loss forward to the following year and claim it subject to those limitations. So companies with big assessed losses, and there are many. Um, if you look at that register of companies, by far the majority of them have got losses. So quite significant, that one. And then interest limitation, section 23 cap M, you've got uh, further limitations coming to, through there. Um, then we move on to the no changes. And, uh, and just to remind ourselves, the VAT rate hasn't changed. That stays 15%. CGT inclusion rates for companies, 80% 80, 80 remains. So the effective rate of, of capital gains tax in a company is 22.4%. And of course, when the tax rate moves down to 27, that drops to 21.6, assuming the inclusion rate stays the same in next year's budget. Um, no change to the dividends tax rate, 20% subject to DTAs, and, uh, and then withholding taxes on interest and royalties remain 15%. Some of the other matters, and I am mindful of time here. Um, so Martin, hang on to your horses. I'm not going to be too much longer. Uh, we've got... Uh, no change in transfer duty rates, no, no change in estate duty and donations tax thresholds, no change in the retirement lump sum tax tables, trust tax rates remain 45%. Interesting, no change in fuel levies. Um, as long as I've been around, I don't remember this happening, but uh, certainly with oil prices where, where they are, um, this is a massive relief. So uh, no change in road accident fund levy, there is a slight increase in the carbon tax fuel levy that's legislated, and that also comes through in the fuel price. So every time you go and fill up your vehicle, you pay six rand to plus or minus. It's uh, six rand sixteen if it's petrol, six rand three cents if it's diesel. Um, but you pay government over six rand every time you put a liter of fuel into your vehicle. So on behalf of government, thank you. Um, the carbon tax rates, those have increased from 134 to 144 rands per ton of CO2 from 1 March 2022. Plastic bag levy goes up slightly. Arson taxes, those have been increased by between four and a half and six and a half. So your bottle of whiskey, your beer, your cigarettes, all of those um, will increase in price uh, from 1 April. And sugar taxes also are going up with effect from 1 April. The crypto asset space, and really this is a talking point for every government. And, uh, you know, if you look at this, it's just a matter of time. So regulation is inevitable. We now see some finality coming through in this process in South Africa and the Intergovernmental FinTech Working Group um, they released a paper in June last year. They are going to finalize the regulation of this space through various acts and institutions during the course of 2022. And one of those is exchange controls. And funny enough, in this budget, we saw quite a move on the exchange control front. So let's just move to that, and, uh, and this is my last slide, so I'm gonna hand you over to Martin after this, but on the exchange control front, just quickly summing up, in 2022, um, we saw the budget announcement whereby our exchange control regime was to change to a capital flow management framework and essentially risk-based system, quite different to the old historic archaic um, exchange control system. We saw a trickle of changes come through as a result of that. Loop structures were abolished. Financial immigration, that terminology was removed. Um, we saw a couple of other changes come through. We're going to see the rest coming through now. So some of the relaxations, and I must say this is very encouraging. 
because, uh, because the plan was to relax exchange controls. It is a barrier to investment. Um, we're going to be able to take dual listed securities and transfer, transfer them to an exchange listed offshore. Um, our discretionary allowances, the 1 million rand, can be used for online foreign exchange trading. So I would imagine that we're talking crypto wallets here um, and buying cryptocurrencies. You cannot use your credit or debit card for that purpose. The detail is still waiting. Um, so we don't have any more detail than that, but, uh, but watch the space. Residents can receive and retain gifts from non-residents offshore. This has been a nightmare for me. I've had so many clients approach me on this issue, and you cannot leave a gift offshore. You've got to get permission to do so. Otherwise, you have to remit it. If not, those assets offshore need to be regularized, and you've got problems with the Reserve Bank. So that's a relief for me. The problem is that it's not retrospective. So if you contravene the regulations in the past, you've got to still come clean and regularize. It's moving forward that this is going to be imposed. Um, <clears throat> date not yet released, so watch the space. And SA residents may now lend or sell authorized foreign assets to other SA residents. Previously, you were prohibited from it. Um, now you can. So you see. Um, a, a gradual relaxation coming through. So watch that and, uh, and we'll see that come through in due course. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and uh, welcome Martin. And uh, Martin, over to you. Thanks, Dieter. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, Dieter, thanks for that update. I will uh, refer back to some of those. Uh, I think it's been, you know, broadly speaking, quite a, a prudent budget. Um, I think we can rest assured that we are in the right hands because, you know, you could get an administration with the populist pressures that we are facing that uh, tip us over the, the, the cliff in terms of their spending habits. And it is clear that the government is really trying to, to draw a, a line in the sand and do the right thing. So I think that's all positive. But... Uh, and it's also realistic. I think the minister is well aware of what's going on. He's well aware of the fact that uh, we had a tailwind from the commodity cycle. Um, but what I want to do this morning is to put the budget into the bigger perspective. Uh, I'm going to start with the global economy, believe it, uh, because that will impact what's happening here. And I just want to, to leave us with um, almost a cautionary note. So yeah, we are making progress but we're not out of the woods yet. Um, and if we're not going to get economic growth, uh, that is the real challenge. We are still going to face uh, major issues going forward, of which one is uh, social unrest, uh, like we had in July last year. So let's start, like I said, right at the top. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the team normally sits down at the beginning of the year and we dot down things that can be needle movers. You can read through that list. That's our theme uh, for this year. I just want to touch on a couple of those and how that can pull through into SA and impact the budget. So global inflation and as a result of that, high interest rates around the world will lift the funding cost for each and every country. And that is why we need to reduce our debt, because if we can't do that, we are going to pay more for debt and we already pay 20 cents in every rand that we collect from uh, a revenue side just servicing the debt. That is taking money away from paying for better education, healthcare and the likes. So our interest cost at the moment is already in line with everything that we spend on policing, education and healthcare. So, so that is how the global environment can impact us. The COVID pandemic is moving into an endemic, and I'll show you a graph on that. That is great because it actually means we can get back to normal economic activity quicker. That can help the budget in terms of economic growth. It also means that, you know, after extending the COVID grant for another year, uh, the need to keep on doing that um, might be uh, coming to an end. Uh, the rest you can read, that's not that important. Chinese slowdown is important because with that comes lower commodities. That's uh, the tailwind we had in terms of uh, overcollecting for the past year. This morning, Russia has been invading the Ukraine. 
Uh, we'll touch on that now briefly, but that's got a major impact again on commodity prices, uh, on inflation and potentially high interest rates. And the last is all about elections, the US midterm elections and policy that might come out as a result of that. And we're also heading for the ANC conference at the end of this year. And hopefully that will uh, not put us in political policy gridlock rather, but uh, we can see a fast track of some of the policy that's been announced in the state of the nation, but also last night. So just quickly on a couple of these central banks, US inflation is now uh, approaching 8%, it's the highest in 40 years. Uh, uh, the central banks are waking up to that fact. They know that they will need to do something about this going forward. So we're in an environment where inflation is probably last year's story, uh, but this year it is going to be about high interest rates in the US. Uh, the reason why we say it's last year's story, if you look at this, the biggest biggest driver behind inflation was used cars and trucks. Why? Because we're not getting chips as a result of the supply issues in, in the East, as a result of factories being closed down around COVID. So we're not getting those chips out to actually be able to manufacture new vehicles. So consumers turn to secondhand vehicles, which obviously increase those prices quite significantly. It's unlikely to happen again this year. And that's why we think it's all about high interest rates. This shows that we're probably approaching the end of the pandemic. Uh, blue line is current data globally for new cases. Brown line is number of people dying. You can clearly see that correlation broke as the world started to get more vaccinated. Uh, and this is great news. This means that we are probably uh, getting closer to normality uh, and health organizations will start focusing more on you know, new deaths or, or severe illness instead of just testing whether you are uh, getting ill. So yeah, this is uh, this morning's uh, front page of the Financial Times. So Russia uh, is in the Ukraine. Um, this is geopolitically bad news. It will cause a lot of volatility. If you look at markets already, it's all red this morning. But there's also opportunities. So gold is at an all-time, uh, not an all-time, uh, the highest level it's been this year. And the oil price is back to $100 uh, per barrel. We uh, saw that last in 2014. Again, how this impact us in terms of the budget is that it creates headwinds for growth. And that's the last thing we need at this point in time. Uh, and again, it adds to potentially higher global inflation or global inflation remaining a little longer sticky, uh, which again is increasing the funding cost, or the cost of capital all around the globe, which is uh, not great for people with a lot of debt like SA. Uh, the reason for that uh, is because there's so many gas pipelines going through the uh, Ukraine. Uh, so that is how it impacts the economic activity. There you can see the increase in natural gas prices and obviously on top of that energy altogether. Uh, and that's how it impacts us uh, right here at home. That's why it's been a relief that there's not uh, any increase on the fuel levy um, because we are going to see an uh, increase in the petrol price uh, just naturally by the increase in the oil price and also as uh, the RAND becomes uh, come more under pressure going forward. Just quickly on the global economy before we go into ESA, that's global economic growth for, for the main economies around the world. You can clearly see that massive uh, recession as a result of COVID. Then we had the huge rebound last year to an all-time high or what they call P growth. And now the world is um, moderating. We are seeing slower growth, but you can see most of those countries are bottoming out. So we're not heading into recession, which is at least some positive news. And the leading indicator suggests that for the next two to three years, growth should still be around very healthy levels. You know, that's in line with previous high levels we've seen. So the global economy from an economic point of view fundamentally remains healthy, but there are definitely some uh, clouds building on the horizon. And some of those, like I've said, is high interest rates and the geopolitical environment. There you can see that global trade, physical exports around the world is very healthy. There we had the slump in 2008. Well, at that time, you couldn't get a, a, a bank willing to finance your container to move from Asia to, to, to the West the banks didn't trust each other because we had the financial crisis this time around it was closing down factories and now we're back into a booming business but this is adding to the supply issues uh, where we are paying more to actually move containers around the world so that's a global environment and we need to understand that because the global environment implies that growth is slowing 
which will also impact on SA. So the tailwind we had last year is getting behind us. We are facing higher inflation and higher interest rates, will, which will impact our funding costs as well. So if you pull that right into SA quickly, this is our economic growth. We're still waiting for the last quarter of 2021 that will be out in the next month. Uh, so the last number we had was for the third quarter of 2021. Uh, we actually went back a little bit in terms of that quarter. You remember that was uh, the July unrest, but also a number of uh, days that we had load shedding. Nevertheless, where we are right now in terms of the size of the economy in billions of rands, you will see that it's exactly the same as the first quarter of 2016. So for the last five years, we didn't go anywhere. If you don't grow the economy, then obviously, and the population is growing, population growth is around about 1.5% per year, then very quickly you are going to sit with all-time unemployment. And that is why I'm saying that what we need to talk about today is actually just economic growth. If we can fix economic growth, we are going to fix unemployment, we are going to fix inequality, and government can start to worry less about debt levels and also where we're going to tax more because the higher growth base will actually relieve the pressure on borrowing more. It will obviously relieve all the, 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 the ratios that we measure like debt to GDP and the, 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 the tax base will increase uh, as a result. This is probably the biggest uh, tailwind that's now turning back into a headwind. This is our exports. Uh, to Europe and Asia, you can see that massive tailwind we had last year for a number of reasons. The world opened up from an all-time low base. Uh, China imported more from us because they had a trade war with Australia, so we benefited from that. We had a great crop season, especially on the citrus side, the third uh, biggest provider of citrus now in the world. And the Europeans were looking for vitamin C with COVID, so we benefit from that. But as the world is going into second gear now, you can see that those numbers are back to the averages that we've seen over the last couple of decades. That tailwind last year, obviously, is the reason why we had more exports uh, on the commodity side. Mining companies collected more tax, and that is the, um, the overshoot that's been presented to us in last night's budget. So if we look at, quickly look at the economic numbers from the budget, the macro outlook, then I'm not going to look at all of those. The bottom line here is the Treasury expect about 5% growth for 2021, which is quite solid. But remember, that's coming off that low base of 2020. And the tailwind that I've just uh, highlighted that contributed to that. And then they see that growth falls down quite quickly. And on average for the next three years is around about 1.8. And that's a bit of a disappointment because like I've said, 1.8 is not going to fix that we are, what, what we are dealing with. 1.8 is slightly better than population growth. So we're not going to fix unemployment and inequality. And looking at these numbers, I'm almost saying, well, you know, if government believes in their own policy and in terms of what's being communicated in the state of the nation and again uh, yesterday afternoon then surely they would expect that growth should be closer to two and a half even three percent not even talking about the five percent that's in the national development plan so it's as if government is almost concerned about the speed of policy implementation or the lack thereof and the minister of the the, the president himself at the state of the nation said that uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, incapable people in cabinet, in certain departments and certain municipalities, and that's really with a bottleneck in terms of executing on these policies. So I'm concerned about growth, and I'll show you a couple of graphs later on, because everything boils down to if we're going to get growth around 2% or not. Because then if you start looking at your ratios, current account percentage of GDP, that obviously is depending on, on that. This is important. There you can see again the surplus that I've showed last year uh, because we exported more than what we ex uh, imported. That will change this year. Our biggest import item, which is oil, is now back to $100 per barrel. And the economy is opening again. We're flying around, we're driving around. So we are going to import more than what we export. So soon the Reserve Bank and Treasury expect that we will be back in a deficit. That's bad news for the RAND. So you can expect the RAND from these levels um, to actually just start uh, uh, weakening further. If we look at some of the budget numbers, the important one here is obviously the deficit. 
So the deficit uh, at this moment is call it close to 6%. It will stay there and then it start to reduce back to about 4%. That is assuming we get about 1.8% growth over the next three years. That is also assuming that we stick to our uh, expense targets and that revenue is doing what is budgeted for over that period. In these numbers, that is obviously the budget balance, but the primary deficit, so that excludes interest payments, uh, they do expect that to be back at neutral or in a surplus by 2023, which is positive, because that shows that we, we are moving in the right direction. Now, just back to the growth thing, because you can clearly see that all these numbers are related to growth. So what is the risk that we're not getting that 2%? And even the minister in his speech yesterday said that 2% is not enough. And I think where we are standing right now, the risk to that number is actually to the downside. It's not to the upside. Okay, first of all, if we look at this, this is... Uh, the IMF uh, forecast for many countries around the world, 2022, 2023, uh, and this is again the concern. So if you look at SA, we're sitting at 1.6. That is a forecast that Treasury is also uh, dotted in yesterday. That is way below Sub-Saharan Af Africa that's sitting at 4, and also way below our trading partners, or rather our peer group in emerging markets that's sitting at 4.6. Brazil is the only country here that's also aligned with 1.6, so we rank on this table as some of the lowest uh, uh, lowest growing countries. Again, if we think about that, that is probably, not probably, it is because of the structural issues we had going into COVID uh, that contributes to this and what we need to fix now ASAP to actually get to more sustainable growth. So this graph is a scenario analysis that the Treasury did was part of the pack uh, that 200 doc. 200 page document to quickly explain that zero year is the baseline. So that's the 1.8% economic growth. Then they've got two scenarios where they say, well, growth can surprise to the upside. So, you know, and I'll explain the scenario now. So if this pans out, then by 2026, instead of 1.8, we could probably sit closer to uh, um, uh, 3%. So that's a positive scenario. And the downside scenario is when things don't work out, we're taking away from growth. So then around about there, instead of 1.8, you're sitting at 1.3. So I think right now, we tilted towards the downside and I'll explain why. So their upside scenario, they are saying the following things, you know, commodity cycle remains quite healthy. Uh, we are implementing the reforms uh, better than expected. And as a result of that, we are removing a lot of the red tape, we're fixing the SOEs, et cetera, et cetera. If I look at the track record of government to date, we are sitting with what I call execution deficit because the policy is there and there's nothing wrong with the policy, but when it's hitting the ground, we don't get those implemented fast and efficiently enough. So the likelihood to get onto this scenario, I think where we're standing right now is quite low. If you look at this scenario, they say, well, the world is facing a couple of headwinds. We're seeing high inflation, high interest rates, geopolitical risk. And if you think about the slides that I've showed you at the beginning, I think we're actually on this trajectory. We are facing a world of slower growth, high inflation, uh, high interest rates, and potentially also geopolitical risk. So I think there's definitely downside to the government's forecast of 1.8, which is why I've said at the start, I think we need to be well aware that we are doing the right things now. We didn't spend all the money that we got extra last year on, on once off. We, did, we, we made sure that we can balance it between uh, the populist policies and the business friendly policies. But I do think over the next two to year, three years, um, we're still going to have some hard work ahead of us. So if you look at this, it's very busy. But the points that I want to make here is there's obviously the uh, the the, the main budget balance or deficit that they expect to decline going forward. That is a positive. This is the debt to GDP, the previous estimates and the current one. So they do see that it will top off around 75% of GDP and get lower, but that's again dependent on your GDP growth. This you can't really see, but this shows the increase in interest payment, which is the same as that line. So you can see that if we can't cap debt, then interest payment is just going to run away. And that is what Tito Mbeweni referred to as a debt spiral. We're not there yet, but that's why I've been warning about uh, the lack of economic growth, but that will put us in, into that scenario. 
So my last slide before we open the floor for, for questions, uh, the risk to the outlook, and this is not my words, this is from the budget speech, a deterioration in GDP growth, global inflation, high interest rate, affecting debt service costs, uh, cost. And I think that is exactly what we are facing uh, this year. So that is it's almost not a risk, but a reality. Uh, the financial position of SOEs, which is also a reality that we are dealing with. Fortunately, government is taking a hard uh, line on that to say, well, you need to prove the value that you can add before you get any more money. So that's positive. The uh, salary bill is still the highest compared to other countries uh, in the OECD relative to our GDP. So depending on the outcome here and what the court cases are going to, to, to um, decide, this is still a risk uh, to, to the outlook. And any new spending programs that's long term of nature that we don't have money for right now will also put some pressure on the fiscal outlook. So that's our outlook. Uh, I think, like I've said, prudent, realistic. Uh, we're doing the right things where we are right now. But yeah, I do think we need to be cautious that, um, you know, we're not out of the weeds yet. And that boils down to the, the risk of our growth numbers. Martin, thank you. Um, I, I, I love the way you ended on a, on a positive note. Um, because I must say, I, I felt quite bleak listening to your presentation. <laughs> I, I must say. The, the downside risk uh, seems to be far more probable um, than, uh, than even the, the projected outcome. So, yeah, I, I must say, I just hope that the will is there um, to carry this through. So, now, Martin, thank you. The, there's, there's been one question that I would just like to... Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it was a question from Gary, who asked, uh, who asked if I could briefly comment on the proposed limitations of Section 23 Cap M interest deductions. Um, it, Gary, it's it's a fairly complex section, but in essence, what it deals with is loans made by South African companies to entities that don't pay tax in South Africa. So tax exempt organizations in South Africa or foreign residents. So where you have a loan between those parties, um, there will be an interest limitation applied according to a formula. And that formula is about 30% of your adjusted taxable income for the current year. So essentially, that's where the change has gone, um, is they've changed the amount that you can claim in any year. So, so that's 23 cap M, but uh, you'll need to go and read the detail there because it is quite a complex section. Um, and uh, it, Martin, sorry, are there, are there any others? Oh, others? Oh, so there's another question about, uh, if you look at the table, so, um, People earning more than 1.5 million a year, there's only 130 odd of them. Um, so the question is, where is all the other wealthy taxpayers? So let me put that into perspective. That, that is actually a good question. So I think it's about 1.8% of taxpayers, that is that 130,000 people, uh, currently pay about 28% of the tax, uh, the payers you earn tax. Um, so that's a very small number paying a huge amount. The risk there, and the minister is well aware of that, uh, includes a lot of your skilled labor, obviously. Uh, and if there's more immigration, then that cohort reduced quite significantly. So that, that is quite, quite a big risk. And it's been reducing uh, over the past number of years. Yeah. Although I think what one needs to keep in mind, this is uh, salaried uh, earners, so people earning a salary like ourselves, where the company is paying payers you earn on a monthly basis. This excludes provisional taxpayers, entrepreneurs, people running their own business. So yes, there's still a lot of wealthy people out there that's not part of that table. That's just normal payers you earn uh, payers. Um, and so it's not just people immigrating. I think that is also people thinking about earning differently and maybe starting their own business with a company where you have tax deductions and the likes. 
So that was yeah. also just another question on the post. Perfect. I see. I see. We've reached. Uh, we've reached our time limit. Uh, finally, an interesting stat on that emigration process and the deemed exit tax on leaving SA. I saw a statistic where twenty-three people paid one point. Five odd billion rand in tax exiting South Africa last year. So twenty three people. Um, so yeah, we we lost some mega wealthy people during the course of last year. Um, but uh, I think that's that's a wrap from us. So Martin, if I can just close by saying thank you so much to you. Um, much appreciated as always, and uh, thanks to all of our listeners. And please feel free to um, send through any email questions that you might have, and uh, and we'll attempt to answer them. So, to all of you, good luck for the rest of the year, and uh, let's hope that those projections materialize on the upside. Thanks, Dad. Speak soon. Thanks, Martin. Great. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye bye all.